Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is our group, including me, Oliver Nguyen, with Lara Fatima and Rietaru Young. Sorry. Uh, we're going to talk about the functional anatomy of bird wings. Wait, what happened? Oh, there we go. So first, it's the evolutions of birds and flying. So we're all familiar with birds, bees, and insects, but do we really understand the evolution of flying? Um, bats are also well known for their aerobatics, and uh, the lovers of spectacular prehistoric bees will know about the Rhesus, which are extinct flying reptiles, some of which have their 10 meters wingspan of flight aircraft. So this is the pterosaurs. So they're the first vertebrates, which means that animals with backbones that evolved powered flight. I have a question for y'all. Which mammals were the first to truly fly at the beginning of 50 million years ago? And it is bad. I know, it's surprising, isn't it? And next slide, I'm going to talk about the first bird. But first, I want us to understand the vocabulary such as phylogenetically, which means the evolution relationships between biological beings, and then theropod, which means bees footed. So there's no longer reasonable scientific doubt that birds evolved from small theropod, which means carnivorous dinosaurs, sometime during or shortly before the middle to late Jurassic, over 150 million years ago. Birds evolved from and are phylogenetically recognized as members of the theropod, which means beast footed dinosaurs. Their first known member in late Jurassic is the Arga Argaeoteryx, and then their closest known non avian, which means not flying relatives, are Dinonychus. So the Argaeopteryx is the one like on the bottom left, and then the Dinonychus is the top one on the right. Next, I'm going to discuss more about the Archaeopteryx. So, um, Archaeopteryx from the late Jurassic Bavaria is now known from seven skeletons and an isolated feather, so that's the fossil they found. They're the first remnant to be recognized in 1860. Every year, there are like new discoveries that said, oh, these must be the oldest bird or bird ancestor comes along, but all of them have failed, which means that Archaeopteryx still stands uh, with time. In 1994, a North Korean bird was found. Um, it was identified as North Korean Archaeopteryx. So uh, it's, the fossil seems to have uh, the wing bones, vertebrate, which is the backbones, and a poorly preserved skull, along with impression of feathers. This specimen is potentially very important because it could test the observation of the diversity of um, ancient birds in the pre -Gratisius. And then next, oh, and uh, this is the fossils they have found in North Korea, the North Korean Archaeopteryx. Next, I'm going to talk about the evolution of feathers. Ooh, I know. Feathers are very beautiful, and we all love feathers. So until very recently, the point at which feathers first developed from scales was not known, and nor was there fossil evidence for their precise phylogenetic diversification into flight. Um, but however, this changed with the recent discovery of a small theropod dinosaur known as Sinosauropteryx which bears a row of small fringe structures along its vertebral column. Um, but on the other hand, we also found that not just this dinosaur had feather, but other din dinosaurs also have feathers. This proves that feather is, did not evolve for flight. But instead, there are many other hypotheses proposed why like other dinosaurs have feather which are insulation, active thermoregulation, and camouflage during its seeking food. 
and this is the Sinosauropteryx fossil that I found. And this is my presentation. I'm going to hand it to the next presenter, Lara. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ari Fatma, and today I'll be covering the structure of a bird, which helps its flying needs. Um, so one of the requirements for flying machines, which are heavier than air, is a structure that combines strength with lightweight, whether that is for birds or for planes. Um, birds are structured in a way that they have physical features that work together and enable them to fly. And the most important ones are wings. Then they need to be lightweight, streamlined, and have a rigid structure so they can fly. Um, and as we can see in this in this slide on the top right hand side, it's a godwiz. Um, and they're lightweight birds, streamlined, and they have rigid structures that helps them to fly. Next slide, please. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about some physical features that help a bird fly. Um, so as I said, birds are lightweight and instead of having heavy bones and dense bones, um, and they have they have light bones and um, birds' bones are basically hollow, unlike us and um, animals. And they have air pockets and thin and tiny cross pieces to make bones stronger, as we can see in the picture in the top right. Um, and even if you see the skeleton of a bird, it's very, it seems very lightweight. Um, birds also have a beak instead of bony jaws and teeth for them to help chew and eat food. And this gives up a lot of weight and also reduces the force of gravitational pull, which we will talk about later in this presentation. Next slide. Okay. Um, some more physical features. They have an enlarged, which means larger than normal, um, breastbone which is called the sternum. It is used as an attachment to the flight muscles. Um, the skeleton of a bird is rigid. That provides firmness, and they have powerful flight muscles as well. So if you see um, in this slide, in the top, top uh, or bottom left, um, the muscles right next to the wings are very strong. And then the blue, uh, the skeleton and the blue um, coloring shows the sternum. Birds also have a streamlined body, which means that they have very less or almost no air resistance while they're flying. Um, as we can see in the top left picture, the bird that is flying is very streamlined. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, some factors affecting birds flying. There are four most important factors, their weight, their lift, drag and up and thrust. Um, so thrust is the one that takes them forward. Drag is the one that drags them backwards. And then lift helps them fly and their weight pulls them down, downwards. Um, so the force of the weight is reduced by them being lightweight and their bones not being as dense. And then there are other factors that also help reduce weight, which is beaks that we discussed earlier. Um, the force of lift is affected by birds having wings. And then the force of drag is reduced by the streamlined bodies and their smooth feathers. Um, last, and lastly, the force of thrust is reduced by the rigid skeleton and the enlarged sternum. Um, birds can also obtain thrust by using their strong muscles and flapping their wings. Some birds may use gravity, for example, jumping from a tree, um, as we can see in, this, in the picture. And this helps them give a forward thrust for flight, while others may use a running takeoff from the ground technique as seen in the picture on the top right. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, talks about some adaptive features. Um, there are different features that birds have to meet their flying needs. Some birds are small and they can manipulate their wings and tail to maneuver easily, such as the fantail, uh, which is the picture in the middle. And then there are hawks with larger wingspan and they're capable of speeding and soaring. Um, and as we can see the hawk in the bottom left, it seems like it's going on a very high speed. Then there are gannets and seabirds, which are streamlined to dive at high speeds into ocean for fish. Um, and as you can see on the top right, the seabird is seems like it's going on a very high speed to dive in. And then we have godwits. They're small, but they're equipped to fly very long distances. Next slide, please. Okay. So there are different ways that birds can fly. Um, we will be touching base over gliding, soaring, and flapping. So gliding is when a bird um, doesn't have to do any work. The wings are held out to the side of the body and they do not flap. 
As the wings move through the air, they are held at a slight angle, which deflects the air downwards and causes a reaction in the opposite direction, which is lift. Um, but there's also drag due to air resistance on the bird's body. So every now and then the bird has to tilt forwards and go into a slight dive so that it can maintain forward speed. Um, the next type, oh, and gliding is shown by the first picture. And then the, another type is soaring. Soaring is a special kind of gliding, and it's when the bird flies in a rising air current. Um, because the air is rising, the bird can maintain its height relative to the ground. As seen in the picture above, um, the albatross uses this type of soaring to support its multi-year voyages at the sea, and uh, it's the one on the furthest right. Um, now let's talk about flapping a little bit, as seen in the second picture. Birds' wings flap with an up and downward motion. This moves them forward. Um, the entire wingspan has to be at the right angle of attack, which means the wings have to twist with each downward stroke to keep aligned with the direction of travel. The inner part of the wing has very little movement and can provide lift in a similar way to gliding. Um, and a guardwood would be a good example of flapping method. Next slide, please. So let's touch base on the wings a little bit. Um, the shape of bird's wings is important for helping them flat lift. The increased speed over a curved and larger wing area creates a longer path of air. In easier words, this means that the air is moving more quickly over the top surface of the wing, reducing air pressure on the top of the wing and creating lift. Um, also, the angle of the wing deflects air downwards, causing a reaction force in the opposite direction and creating lift. And then the larger the wings are, they produce greater lift, and if they have smaller wings, it's smaller. So small winged birds need to fly faster so they can maintain the same lift as those with larger wings. Um, and as you can also see in the picture, the air is being pushed down as the um, wings are flapping. And now I'll pass it on to Young. Okay, so which major muscles are used in flight? The pectoralis muscles are known as the chest muscles or massive in birds. This is because of the amount of energy that is required to you to create the downward stroke. And the spiraculus bias is used to raise the wings. Fun fact, the frigid bird that you can see on the top right can actually fly up to two months without touching the ground or without drinking water. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, you are currently experiencing 1G force. So gravitational re force refers to the uh, force that exists between all objects. So as you can see in the figure, uh, if you were to be in Jupiter, since it's uh, 2.3 times bigger than Earth, uh, you would actually feel like you are two times heavier in, uh, in Jupiter. So you can't go to space. So on a roller coaster, you may experience like your weight is pushing down. That is because you are feeling about four to six Gs. So if you're experiencing, so you're experiencing in a short period of time, about four to six times your own body weight. This will be very uh, important in later in the slide, so please uh, keep this in mind. Next slide, please. So today's race time. Okay, so our contestants, we have the peregrine falcon, cheetah, and ostrich. Which animal do you think is the fastest? Okay, next slide, please. I know most of you all thought that it was the cheetah, but it's actually the peregrine falcon. It can reach up to 200 miles per hour. If you can please play the video, please. What I'm going to show you is the peregrine swooping and catching a duck. When the peregrine falcon will go about 3,000 feet in the air and experience about 25 Gs. A normal jet fighter can handle up to only 8 to 9 Gs. After 14 Gs, it can cause internal damage to your organs. So they impact the pigeon and make them feel temporarily paralysis or shock, and then they can uh, get the pigeon. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we will now open up the uh, presentation to 
uh, questions.